is the basis of all independence. Hello, this is Dr. B's Revolution Will Not Be Pesticides, and in this video, we are going to take you back to the year 2015, to my trip to Dominica. Now, where is Dominica and why did I go to Dominica, is the question. Well, Dominica is a tiny little Caribbean island in the Lesser Antilles. And I think it's actually technically classified as the most southern leeward island, right before that break in the archipelago of islands there that turned into the windward islands. Dominica is just north of Martinique and just south of Guadeloupe. One of the other neighboring islands is also Marie Galant. And it was it is an English speaking country with French Creole as one of the unofficial languages that people speak behind closed doors or in the comfort of their homes, etc., etc. Why did I go to Dominica at, in the year 2015? Well, the, year, the reason why I went was because Dominica was the place in which I did my dissertation research on. What was my dissertation research on? Well, it was on African resistance to enslavement in the Americas. And one of the reasons why I chose Dominica is because Dominica was a very special case to me. I had a professor by the name of Dr. Selwyn Carrington at, when I was a student at Howard University. And he told me to, to, to look at some of the ceded islands. The ceded islands in the West Indies consisting of Tobago, Grenada, St. Vincent, and Dominica. And he says, look at, the, look at the influence of the French that the French might have had on the rebellions in those respective islands. So I decided to look at it. Now, prior to researching Dominica, to, prior to researching specifically the ceded islands, these are the four islands that were ceded to the British from the French in the Treaty of Paris of 1763. Prior to looking at these islands, I was more focused on Grenada because Grenada is the place where my mom comes from. But in looking at Grenada, I didn't... Something didn't click there. I, I, I wasn't really completely satisfied with the information that I was getting from examining Grenada. And I also was, was wanting to actually create a space of my own as a, as a scholar in which I can study a, an area in which I don't feel like a lot of historians have really touched on too much. So as I, as I was looking through the Ceded Islands, Dominica stood out the most. Because one of the things I was always most interested in when studying uh, history of black people in the Americas is always looking at the African connections looking at the cultural Africanisms that had made it into the Americas and looking at those Africanisms that had influenced rebellions, resistance, philosophy, etc., etc. Dominica, when I was reading through the secondary sources, to me fit that description. One of the secondary sources, one of the first secondary sources that I read about Dominica came from uh, Michael Creighton's Testing the Chains. And some of the names that he was referring to in this book were, were actually African names, right, of, of, the, of the rebels in the Maroon community. Now, Dominica's resistance to enslavement came in the form of a, a Maroon community. But the thing about Dominica is, as I started to get more and more interested in it, I started to realize there were, weren't that many people that were really talking about Dominica and the significance that they played in terms of resistance to enslavement. And, and when I'm talking about resistance to enslavement, Dominica exemplified a non-compromising resistance to enslavement in that island between the year 1763 to roughly the year 1814, right? And when I'm talking about this non-compromising uh, spirit of Dominicans, um, it was, there was a body of maroons. And what is a maroon? A maroon is basically a runaway slave someone who decides that they are not going to uh, submit to the rule of the colonial powers or submit to the rule of the masters and they decide that they are going to um, run away to a territory that they call their own whether it's a swamp whether it's a mountaintop whether it's in in the forest somewhere and they're going to protect and defend that territory at all costs now you will find throughout diaspora history that sometimes maroons are often uh, credited for um, fighting for their freedom, but they're also known 
for also compromising a little bit. Compromising meaning signing treaties with the colonial government and the society in which they reside. And these treaties usually consist of a, the compromise consisting of returning new runaways or ser serving as a defense force for internal insurrections or external in invasions to those respective colonies. The thing that I realized that made Dominico so special is that they never compromised in any of those ways. And this is one of the re things I started to realize when doing my research. So, the deeper I got into it, going through the secondary sources of Dominica, I started to go into the primary sources. And the primary sources I found when I ended up traveling in the year 2014, I traveled to London, Kew Gardens, Archives, I traveled to France, South France, Aix-en-Provence, in a uh, archive known as Les, Les Archives Nationales d'Outre-mer. And I also traveled to uh, Dominica in the year 2015. And when I was in Dominica to get the uh, primary source evidence and research, it all started to come together and it all started to make sense about the uncompromising nature of these maroons. But I also wanted to get, not only did I want the, the archival evidence, right, I also wanted to get a feel for the Maroons and also a feel for Dominican culture. So ironically, while I was there, um, there was, there's an, uh, an author and publisher known as Polly Patulo, who, who had just recently wrote, written a book about the Maroons. And her book is called, Your Time Is Done Now. And Your Time Is Done Now is basically discussing using primary source evidence, primary source research, compiled the, uh, this primary source research to, um, to tell a story of the Maroon Trials of 1813 and 1814. Now these Maroon Trials of 1813 and 1814, uh, it actually, without really um, having any secondary interpretation of the trials, she kind of just lays out the facts for what they are in these primary source documents. So you actually can hear the voice of the enslaved, hear the voice of the colonial masters, hear the voice of the people, the contemporaries of that time period. It's a very fascinating, very interesting book. And um, I, I met her there. I, I was able to get some connections with people, some, with some of the people that were there in Dominica. And they introduced me to her. She signed my book, and then she told me that she that um, actually uh, throwing a play, running a play. She had put together this play that was based on the book that she wrote and based on that primary source material from the uh, Maroon Trials of 1813 and 1814. And so you can see... I got the opportunity to be there and actually watch actors act out the role of the Maroons and the voices of the Maroons uh, during this period.
descendants from these trials have written down in the leather books of the time.
Do you promise to tell the truth? Yes, sir. Did you ever see a runaway in Joe's house? Yes. Often, sir. Did you ever see a in prison? They tell me that he used to go in the prisoner's house and at Victor's. I even hear them say that Joe and Victor was in company with Elephant when he was shot. Marishan. By being runaway and being found in the camp of the runaways. Call in Private Jermaine as next witness. Private Jermaine. Private Jermaine. Private Jermaine. And to see the people of the community come out and also the supporters of Polly Patulo come out. I thought it was all it was all great. Um but not only did I want to get a sense of, of Dominica's culture, I end up going into town and there's this 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 statue of a maroon by the name of Jacko, who probably had the longest tenure in the woods as a maroon chief. And uh that kind of gives you gets this gives you an idea of, you know, the culture of Dominica. I think more so, and especially in more recent times, and as I was starting to discover then, that for a long time, with Dominica being under colonialism up until 1978, Dominica's narrative was always a, it was a, it was a very pro-Anglophone British narrative. Any site that the British were, had, had, had been criminals in their efforts at colonization or anything like that, uh, was a no-no. You couldn't talk about those, those things in school. But as time has gone on in Dominica, I feel like more, more and more there are historians that are coming out that are bringing the, the truth to the surface. And I felt an honor, it was an honor for me to be a part of this, uh, this truth-telling of Dominica. And, 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 and I was able to network with a lot of people. And, and even in more recent times, I've, I've met up uh, with people like, like Thompson Fontaine, who wrote a book on the Maroons. I've met up with people like Gabriel Christian, who is uh, a lawyer out of Maryland, who is originally from Dominica, who is also very well connected with people in high places in Dominica and other parts of the African diaspora. But I, uh, this, this, me doing this research afforded me the opportunity to to get connected with uh, with the diaspora. Nevertheless, later on that week, I ended up getting in touch with a guide known as Francis. And Francis, he took me into the... Uh, we met up in St. Patrick's, um, Dominica, the parish of St. Patrick's. And we ended up going through a, a sugar plantation, a former sugar plantation, where they had all the old mechanisms of the sugar plantation. up into the mountains where the Maroons would have been. This part of Dominica was a hotbed for revolutionaries in, during the 1790-1791 New Year's Day conspiracy. Uh, most of the conspirators were actually from the, the Bertrand plantation that, that, that was in St. Patrick and, and some of them actually came from the, Ro, the Rosalie estate which is a little bit farther north just outside of the St. Patrick's parish. 
But these rebels, these conspirators, they had organized uh, a major revolt to basically exterminate all the whites, starting with the ones on the windward side of the island, which is this side of the island where St. Patrick's is, and then they're going to work their way to the other side. This was the goal. Um, the, the way the story went was that Farcell, who was the Maroon, was organizing chiefs and sub-chiefs in the parish of St. Patrick on the Bertrand Plantation. But what ended up happening was uh, one of, the, one of the, the enslaved peoples ended up bringing in a French mulatto, French revolutionary from Martinique by the name of Paulinaire. Paulinaire, based on the, on the primary source records that I'd, that I'd read, Paulinaire, as soon as he joined the efforts, Farcel, slowly but surely, kind of backs out. You don't hear anything of Farcel after that point. So one of the things I noticed where, you know, as I'm looking through the primary resource, resources, I'm like, look, why is it that, one of the questions that I have is, why is it that as soon as you start hearing about Polinaire joining forces, the French mulatto, Farcel, steps out. He's no longer involved. And my presumption, personally, is that there might be some kind of, like, colorism, culturalism differences that... that Farcel and Polinaire might have had, right? I argue that the Maroons were very Afrocentric. They are very Afrocentric, and not in, a, in a, not in a generic way, but a lot of them were actually born in Africa. They had understandings of traditions, they had an understanding of philosophy, and they had an understanding of a lot of things. And I think a lot of them couldn't necessarily quite trust French revolutionaries, even if their skin tone might have been close to theirs. 